Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you so much for joining us all today. I know we're still getting uh, more participants coming in. Um, but thank you all for joining us this afternoon. My name is Lina Maria Murillo, and I am professor, assistant professor in the departments of Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies and History um, here at the University of Iowa. And it is um, really my pleasure to host this conversation today uh, with Professor Carol Jaffe and Francine Thompson. Um, before we uh, officially, officially start, I just have to go uh, do a little business here and thank all of our wonderful sponsors. Um, there are so many. Uh, and, and so I'll start with, with some of my home departments, uh, Department of Gender, Women and Sexuality Studies, uh, the Department of History, um, the College of Public Health, the Department of Sociology and Criminology, the Department of American Studies, Latina, Latino, Latinx Studies, the Department of Communication Studies, School of Journalism and Mass Communication, uh, Department of Anthropology, the College of Nursing, the Department of, of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the Carver College of Medicine, all University of Iowa, um, as well as the Oberman Center for Advanced Studies. Um, uh, the, this this uh, panel today has come out of a working group um, that we have there um, focused on, on reproductive justice and reproductive health. Um, we also would like to thank the Emma Goldman Clinic and Prairie Lights. Um, Prairie Lights has also generously agreed to donate 20% of uh, purchases of Dr. Carol Jaffe's book, which I'm gonna hold up here, Obstacle Course. We'll be talking about this today. Um, and uh, we've got a link to it in the chat there. So please take a look. And also, um, I, I'd love to thank my dear colleague and, and comrade in the struggle, who's the producer of this webinar today, Dr. Um, Natalie fixmar Arays. So again, welcome to everyone. Um, and I'm going to also take a second to introduce our wonderful panelists today. It's my pleasure. Um, and really an honor to have uh, two incredible, wonderful, um, radical fighters for abortion health um, in the US sitting with us this afternoon. First, I'll introduce Professor Carol Jaffe. She is professor in the Advancing New Standards in Reproductive Health, um, known by its acronym ANSWER program in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology and Reproductive Sciences at the University of California, San Francisco. She's also a Professor Emerita of Sociology at the University of California, Davis. She has written several books on abortion, including Doctors of Conscience, The Struggle to Provide Abortion um, Before and After Roe v. Wade, and that was in 1996. Uh, we also have Dispatches from the Abortion Wars, The Cost of Fanaticism to Doctors, Patients, and the Rest of Us, published in 2011. And of course, her latest book, which we'll be discussing today, Obstacle Course, The Everyday Struggle to Get an Abortion in America. Um, and I'm very uh, also fortunate to introduce um, Francine Thompson uh, to our panel. She is Executive Director of the Emma Goldman Clinic in Iowa City, Iowa. The clinic has the distinction of being the oldest continuously operating not-for-profit feminist identified provider of abortion care in the United States. Um, in her role as a director of the Emma Goldman Clinic, Francine Thompson is responsible for the operations and management of the abortion, gynecology, and other health service departments at the clinic. Her 33 years as administrator of an independent feminist healthcare clinic that provides abortion care has given her extensive experience in reproductive health care management. She has overseen the development and implementation of many cutting edge services. The most recent include transgender care, including hormone therapy, PEP and PrEP, which involve prophylaxis for HIV exposure. She continues to be challenged and motivated by the unending assaults within the reproductive justice and abortion care movement. Her passion includes training students and volunteers and the next generation of feminist healthcare providers and activists. Um, so our, my hope, our hope today is to be able to, um, to discuss the past, present, and future of abortion care in America through the lens of scholarship 
and through um, through the lens of, of providers on the ground and grassroots organizing. Um, and uh, to talk about the significance of abortion in relation to bodily autonomy and, and as we'll, we'll argue, I think also democracy. Um, so to start, I, I'd like to ask you both to perhaps situate yourselves within the, this broader history. Um, and I'll start with, with Professor Carol Jaffe. Can you tell us um, how you came to, to study abortion care and, and what was abortion care like when you started? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, first, let me say um, how happy I am to be here. I want to thank Lena. I want to thank Natalie. I want to thank the many, many, many uh, different people who sponsored this. I am just honored to be on the platform uh, with Francine. Uh, the Emma Goldman Clinic is legendary among anybody who knows anything about abortion in this country. Um, and I should say Francine herself is legendary. She has done, she has stayed the course for 33 years. So I, I could not be, this, this is what I do. I get happy when I get to talk to abortion providers. That, that's me. Um, anyway, so how, how, how did I get there? Um, interestingly, perhaps uh, oddly to contemporary ears, the, the journey started when I was a grad student in sociology uh, in Berkeley in the late 60s, early 70s. And I, I, I was studying childcare, not abortion. I mean, that's what my thesis was about. And I mean, today when we think of childcare, we think of something that's underfunded, not, not enough of it, especially now during COVID, but not especially controversial. But back then it was. It was one of the first demands of the feminist movement. Right away, a, a quote pro family movement arose in opposition uh, to childcare programs. So that very early on alerted me to the fact that feminist issues such as childcare and a little bit later, such as abortion, were going to be opposed by a very by very strong movements. Uh, in 1974, I went to Philadelphia. I took my first job at a school of social work. Some and the, the year is very important. Um, I think my career really reflects being in the right place at the right time. Uh, I was teaching a course on gender and public policy. Some of my students graduated, got jobs in the very first abortion clinic being established in Center City, Philadelphia at Planned Parenthood. And my students said, Carol, come on down. You'll, you'll find this interesting. And that, that was over 40 years ago, and I still find it interesting. So really, that's how it, it all started. And you know, when you asked me to reflect on um, what abortion care was like then, it was quite different. Um, there was inklings of that there was going to be opposition, in fact, violent opposition, but that happened actually quite slowly. Um, I mean, the, the, the real blockades at abortion clinics uh, really didn't happen until the late 80s. The first abortion provider wasn't killed till 93. So the first years were relative to what came later, relatively tranquil, medically speaking, quite different. Uh, we did not have then medication abortion. Uh, that didn't come to this country till 2000. And that really has dramatically changed things especially now that we're, in, uh, we're, that we're in the COVID phase of things. So in some, I mean, the things that stayed the same were the incredible dedication I saw of abortion providers then and what I see uh, even more so today. Thank you, Professor Jaffe. Francine, can you tell us how you, how you joined this, this movement and, and what your journey was to, to uh, working at the Emma Goldman Clinic? I think she's still muted. Yeah. I also want to say thank you um, for the invitation to be here. Um, and I'm a little in awe because, of course, um, Carol is a legend in the abortion care movement. And so um, it's uh, really an honor to be on a panel with her, even though I've certainly been in her presence before. So um, thank you for inviting me and for all of the sponsors um, and the organizers. So my journey to abortion care really started via my activist roots and 
um, I was really surrounded by really strong women who, although they might not have called themselves um, feminist, um, they certainly um, were feminist. And then I grew up in the 60s with the civil rights movement and with the Black Pride and Black Power um, movement also. And in my later teens and early 20s, I was really awakened to global oppression and apartheid and then the women's rights movement. So from what I knew about the Emma Goldman Clinic as a place where someone, um, where women were encouraged to really stretch and to grow, um, to find their voice and to share in the work of um, providing what seemed like to me life-changing and sometimes um, life-saving care for women. Mm -hmm. It seemed like the dream job. So when a job opened up, I applied for it. I interviewed um, with about half of the collective, which was about 12 people at the time. I interviewed at least a couple times and then I was hired. And so that was certainly my journey from activism to actually doing the practical work um, within an abortion clinic. Um, when I think about what abortions um, looked like then, I started a little later in 87, and it doesn't seem that there's a lot of difference in the um, process that a woman goes through or what happens when um, a woman um, decides to have an abortion and gets into the, the clinic. That At that time, we were only providing first trimester abortion services, but the actual steps haven't really changed that much. There's a lot more paperwork for sure, um, but <laughs> client education, informed consent, conversations regarding feelings directed by the client in the abortion and recovery, it really hasn't changed much. Of course, now we offer second trimester abortions and medication abortions, including um, by mail with the genuity study, but the bones of an abortion appointment really feel pretty similar to 1987. And so one of my, you know, my, my follow-up question to that is, um, what have you both seen um, as some of the sort of major changes in the political tactics? And, and you both sort of ta started talking about this, the political tactics um, and, and activist strategies of those opposing um, abortion provisions. What has been sort of the change that you've noticed? Who, who did you want to uh, answer? Either, either of you, either of you can jump on in. Well, Francine, since you are much more the direct recipient of these tactics, why, why don't you? What have you seen, yes, since 1987 to now? What have been some of the marked changes? Sure. Well, I, you know, I remember the primary strategy for um, attacking abortion provisions when I started was really the use of fear, intimidation, and violence. And Operation Rescue at that time was having large scale demonstrations. And sometimes they were rushing the front door and um, sitting down in front of it. We were worried about things like anthrax and arson and even outright assassination. Carol's already mentioned, you know. Dr. David Gunn in Brookline in Massachusetts, Bart Slepian, and then Dr. Tiller, of course. And so it was a really unsettling time to work in abortion care. And we spent a really large amount of time on safety and training and putting security systems in place. But almost at the same time, they were doing this legisla legislation as strategy because Webster and Casey were happening within that same period of time. And, um, you know, I think that the strategy, even though initially it was about um, violence, it's always kind of been to tie up resources at clinics and primarily financial resources. And so mm -hmm. all of the legislative battles that take time and money, um, you know, depending on the outcome, they take even more time and money to get into compliance with those and of course, those things, um, even though they're directed at clinics, there's a trickle down um, to the clients. And so I think the actual tactics in terms of the direct violence at clinics has moved more towards legislation. But I think the end game has always been to take up time and resources so that clinics don't have funds in order to be able to operate. Yeah. And if, right, and if I can add to that, you know, when Francine was talking, I, I was thinking of an old lyric from a Woody Guthrie song. Um, 
And the lyric goes, some will rob you with a shotgun and some with a fountain pen. Now, he was not talking about abortion claims. Uh, he was talking about how poor people were preyed upon in, in, in the Midwest. But, uh, but uh, Francine is right, of course, that, I mean, the, the violence hasn't stopped. It comes and goes in waves. And I should say, not to scare people, but most of the worst violence happens when we have democratic presidents. When we have a Republican administration, uh, the, the people, uh, the antis, as we call them, uh, feel, well, look, the Republicans in Washington and in the states will take care of us. Um, so the worst violence has happened during a Democratic administration. And I am sure Francine and all her colleagues have noted this and are taking adequate security uh, provisions. But I just want to highlight the importance of the 2010 elections. That was the first midterm after, uh, after Obama's first election. And that really changed everything with respect to abortion. Huge gains uh, by Republicans and state legislatures across the countries. And we just saw a, an influx, I mean, a flood of restrictions. Uh, restrictions that, as Francine pointed out, just uh, are annoying, uh, extraordinarily expensive, and really drain clinics and their lawyers, you know, time uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and efforts. Um, on the flip side of this, um, what have been the ways that, that abortion providers um, and, and activists have, you know, strategized around, around these sorts of attacks? What, what, is, the, what is the other side doing um, in some, and in some ways I, I ask that question in, in that matter because it so often feels like our side is playing, and I say our side as people who support uh, abortion, but um, we're playing offense. You know, we're oftentimes it seems that we're waiting for them to act and then and then we react. Um, how has this changed over over the time that you've been uh, that both of you've been working on these these issues? Did you want to go, Francine? Um, you know, I, I don't know if I have a whole lot to say about that. I'm sure you have more to say, but, you know, I think that there's been even an ebb and flow um, with the, you know, when I talk about the local community in terms of the um, response and support. And we've always, we've been blessed really um, in Iowa City to have this really very supportive um, community. And at least in the last four years, we've seen that outpouring of support um, that it's increased, that it's louder, it's stronger, it's more direct, that um, we really have folks who really want to get involved in whatever way that they can. Mm -hmm. um, well, if I can add to that, you know, one of the things that David Cohen, my co-author and I uh, say in our book is uh, one of the things we point to, uh, the incredible importance of the evolution of the abortion rights movement into a reproductive justice movement. I mean, that has been extraordinarily important, you know, brought, in, brought new ways of understanding, brought many people, especially younger women of color in, into the movement. And so that, that's a very welcome development. What's been extraordinarily important you know, across the country, uh, and uh, you know, Francine alluded to this, you know, the support that clinics get and the incredible importance of, of escorts. I mean, one of the things we talk about in our book is which should come to no surprise as anybody, you know, just the often horrible uh, harassment patients get as they try to get into the clinic. And, you know, so escorts um, ha have been incredible. Now, obviously, something that the pro-choice movement has encouraged uh, is voting. And, and if we look at the last election, that has with respect to abortion, and I'm thinking specifically of the uh, a lot of the Senate races, uh, that hasn't gone as so well. Um, I mean, what's fascinating and what people constantly ask is, we get all these polls, 70% of the American public supports Roe versus Wade. So how, how come we're losing? How come, we, how come in this election, when it was clear um, that there are now six justices on record as as willing to overturn it, you know, what happened? And I don't have a good answer at this point. We don't have good analyses of how many people voted because they were happy about Amy Coney Barrett or they were 
furious about it. But um, I think in general, what we do know is that the American public is pro-choice, but not as intensely so as those who are opposed to abortion. I mean, people who are opposed to abortion, they will vote on that issue alone. Wow. Not necessarily true for those on our side. And just a, a quick um, question, or, or to maybe um, focus on this just for a second. Do, do you think, um, Carol, that this is one of the strategies that's lacking on our side, you know, to focus sort of on more local and state elections and to get people out to vote? So to think about, I think what happens with many people is that they assume that, you know, we have sort of federal protection via Roe v. Wade. And so everyone sort of puts their eggs in that, the, the sort of that basket rather than, you know, going state by state in the way the other side has, right, right. To, to, to shore up um, support. Um, well, you're, you're absolutely right, Lena, that, I mean, historically, Democrats have been much less um, sharp about voting down the ballot uh, than Republicans. I mean, there's starting to be awareness of that. But I mean, after Obama was elected, Democrats lost a thousand seats, you know, it's state, local, you know, Congress people, um, you know, so there's recognition, but, but, but it's, it's catch up. I mean, Republicans are just much more politically effective, uh, you know, at, at the local level. Uh, but before I drag everybody down, I mean, I do want to <laughs> I do want to say that, you know, blue states, as red states get redder, blue states are getting bluer. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of, pro finally, we've seen proactive measures in a number of bluer states to make sure Roe will remain, even if it's overturned at the federal level. Uh, the city of Austin, the city of New York has uh, donated local funds to help women coming uh, from out of town to get abortions. Uh, the state, in some states, for example, Maine, after the last election, which not this one, in 2018, that brought in a woman governor replacing a really horrible governor before her, um, uh, advanced practice clinicians, that is nurse practitioners, midwives, physician assistants, uh, can now provide abortion uh, in the state of Maine as they are, as they can do elsewhere. So blue states are getting bluer. The problem, and I'm, I'm sure we'll get to talk about this more as, as we go along, the problem is <laughs> women in red states are increasingly needing to get to these blue states. And that's really the challenge facing uh, the pro-choice movement. And quickly, Francine, can you, you know, what is it like in many ways being in this very blue city um, in this ocean of red in, in Iowa um, and, and more specifically as, as sort of a feminist collective, um, which I think sort of adds that extra, that extra layer of um, sort of politicization of the clinic. You know, well, it's certainly um, insulating and also <laughs> provides some level of a buffer, but then there's this reality of the clients that we serve, only about 30% of the clients that we actually see are from within the Iowa City and the immediately surrounding area. So we're certainly providing services for those women that are coming from the rest of the um, red areas. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's challenging, um, but I, I'm not sure that it's challenging for anyone but us. I'm not sure that um, when folks come to the clinic that they're thinking about the fact that they came from a red area, they're coming to the closest available um, clinic that had the first available time for them to be seen. And this brings me um, to ask, you know, to sort of get into the, the, the meat and potatoes of, of Carol's book. And so I'll ask Carol to sort of take one, one part of the, the, the issues in the book, and then I'll ask Francine to, to deal with the others. So I'm, you know, is it possible for you to give us some of the examples that you and 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 David Cohen, your co-author, write about, um, and, and sort of give a couple of examples of, of what are the obstacles that that pregnant people face um, before they get to the the parking lot, 
right? Um, I'll, I'll let friends take ticket from the parking lot to the inside the clinic. Um, but, but if you could start with, you know, from the moment of just making the decision to, to go, getting to a clinic. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the way that David and I have organized our book, it, each chapter represents a step on the way for a woman or a person to get an abortion um, and the obstacles that they face, you know, at every step. I mean, what you find out you're pregnant, uh, how, do you how do you decide in a context where there's so much stigma around abortion, where you perhaps can't tell your uh, family members? Uh, how, how do you decide when there's so much fake <laughs> to, to, to coin a phrase when there's so much fake news around abortion on the internet. Uh, and then you, you try to get a referral and perhaps your local doctor, if you have a primary physician, he or she will misinform you. And then of course, there's the, the um, um, then there's of course the issue of the fake clinics, the so-called crisis, uh, you know, crisis pregnancy centers that pretend to be abortion clinics but you go in and they lie to you. I mean, they say, oh, you have plenty of time to decide. I mean, they do an ultrasound and then they lie. I mean, you have plenty of time to decide when in fact the person may not have plenty of time to decide. Or, oh, you're too late. You can't even get an abortion when in fact they're not too late. So you, there's misinformation, there's obstacles. That, and of course, one of the major obstacles is paying for the abortion. Um, I mean, you, you, Lena, to go back to something you said, you asked us before, you said, what was abortion care different? How was it different back, back then in the 70s uh, and 80s? One of the main differences is the transformation in who the abortion patient population is. Um, uh, in the 70s, it was the, the face of the abortion patient was primarily white college girls. It doesn't mean that's the only people who got them, but, but they were a good chunk of, um, of the patient pool and they were the face of the abortion protests and so on. Uh, for a variety of reasons that you know, we could go into, uh, the, the patient population has really changed dramatically. Three quarters of, a, of contemporary abortion patients are poor. Half of them severely poor, half of them below the poverty line, another 25% just above it. Uh, we are talking disproportionately women uh, and people of color. So that really has changed things and it makes all these obstacles even, even harder and not simply paying for an abortion. And I should say that one of the things that surprised me and you know, I, as I've made clear, I've studied abortion a long time. I was sort of arrogant, thought I knew everything. Uh, I just wanted to document what I knew but what I was actually very surprised to find out when we did all our interviews, and we interviewed providers and we used published stories of patients, uh, was hearing how hard it was, not just to pay for the abortion, but just to get there. When you have a population of women uh, living in homeless shelters or who are very poor, they don't have cars, how do they get, I'm sure Francine can fill in the blanks here, but just, getting to a, a, to a clinic. And then once you finally manage to get there, uh, if your car doesn't break down or if your ride actually keeps the commitment to take you there, and oftentimes that doesn't happen, um, you, you're faced with waiting periods. In some states, 24 hours, in other states, 48, and a handful of states, 72 hours. Um, so you need lodging. And so anyway, it is just extraordinarily difficult in a way it was not back in the day to just literally get to the clinic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Red scene, do you mind taking it from the parking lot and then into, into what, what people, pregnant people face when they go you know, into the clinic? Um, sure, but I, I, I also would just wanna say that this particular question, it really gives me an opportunity to lift up and remember a really incredible person in the abortion care movement, Ruth Garrick, may she rest in peace. Mm -hmm. um, Ruth came to the clinic, um, she was uh, an abortion care consultant. She ran a clinic, she worked at a clinic, and then she became a consultant. And she came to provide a training at the Emma Goldman Clinic more than 20 years ago when um, we, uh, when um, she was working with Park Davis. And 
Um, two things from um, her training have stuck with me and we actually still continue to use some of those things. Um, one of them is that she had a wonderful list of 101 things to do when your numbers are low. And the other was that she took us through this exercise where you just threw up on the board everything that a client had to go through in order to get have an abortion done. And some of them might seem like, um, you know, fairly simple things, but the intent was to really counter the untruth that abortion was this simple and easy thing to do that, you know, women got pregnant, didn't want to be in and had an abortion. So you have this really long list of um, what has been really laid out very well in obstacle course about what a client has to go through. Um, and then they get to the clinic and there's still more to go through. And along the way, it's like there's a, a gazillion things that could be the one barrier that could prevent an individual woman from not being able to access abortion services. Mm -hmm. So for one person, her one barrier may be funds, but for another, it may be that she just can't cross the parking lot and go past the, you know, the protesters. So, um, you know, all of those thousands of things that the women have to go through, um, it only takes one thing that might be the thing that prevents a woman from accessing care. And so primarily when they get into the clinic, we still have them have to do things that they have to do in order to have a medical procedure done. And um, it may be as simple, you know, maybe things like filling out medical histories and providing us with um, reproductive and sexual history that maybe they don't really want to share with us. Um, you know, we now we have to get things like, um, you know, next of kin or, a, you know, an emergency contact. And, um, we need IDs because we have parental notification. Not everybody has an ID. Um, it made me think when Carol was talking about cars breaking down, there was a time when Greyhound took you everywhere. You know, now that you can barely find a Greyhound or a Trailways bus and they might run once a day or they're going to stop 30 miles from um, where you might need to get. And so there's just so many things that could ultimately be a barrier for a woman, even once they get past the yelling and um, screaming um, protesters. We know that COVID has um, increased that um, because now we have to screen folks at the door, um, have them wear a mask, and we no longer um, allow folks to have supporters, which um, for many um, people is a really important part of the process is to have a support person here. So there's so many things um, that could possibly provide an obstacle for a woman once they get um, to the clinic um, beyond the legislative stuff. And quickly, could you just tell us a little bit about the sort of, so Carol mentioned the sort of um, the mis disinformation of, of you know, before they go into the clinic. So all the fake news, even, you know, trying to Google and, and figure out a place to go. But then, you know, many states have passed laws where physicians have to, you know, purposefully lie to their patients and tell them things like, you know, if you get an abortion, um, you're you know, more likely to get cancer or, or some of these things. Um, what has been your experience with, with those types of, of laws um, here in, in Iowa? Right now, we don't currently have any of the mandatory counseling, but we do have um, to offer um, women the option to view the ultrasound, um, to hear a heartbeat if it's audible, and to um, certify that they were offered um, that option. And, you know, every now and then a, a few women take us up on that option, but um, I haven't seen that it's um, changed a lot of um, minds from um, the decision of whether or not to continue with the with the process. Um, so, um, you know, I think one of the harder things for women once they get into the clinic are, is if they've been given some misinformation um, outside the door. Um, they're often given brochures and pamphlets or, or told, um, you know, don't kill your baby uh, or, you know, you're going to die or some, whatever's going to happen to them. And so they come in very upset and we have to deescalate, um, you know, from that point on. For somebody who may have already 
had their own issues and concerns about their decision to have an abortion that now they have this compounded by the folks who are also um, placing this shame on them. Um, we, we did actually have a, a client that came and was told um, outside the door by one of the protesters that she would um, do it for free for him to go to their clinic. And so she sent her off to um, uh, the crisis pregnancy center in town. And um, they kept her there for a while and the client came back just irate because of course she wasn't able to get an abortion there and um, we had to reschedule her. And so those kind of things happened, but money was a primary concern for her. And she was told that if she went to this other clinic, they would do the procedure for free. So people do get misinformation um, and they get you know emotionally chastised before they get in the clinic. And so we end up spend an extra time and energy really, um, you know, walking them back from that. Yeah, if I can just add, um, I mean, I'm very, <clears throat> in the thank God for small favors department, I'm, you know, I'm very pleased that in Iowa, you only have, you have to offer the option. In some states, you know, you have to show the clinic, excuse me, you have to show the patient her ultrasound. Uh, the the patient has to look and hear of, uh, in some states, you know, uh, you know, from top to bottom, either the doctor or the tech or the ultrasound tech describe the development of the fetus. I mean, this is, serves no purpose other than to shame, to shame the patient. My colleagues uh, at Answer, you know, have studied the ultrasound, you know, descriptions ex extensively. It changes very few minds, if any, but it certainly upsets people. In other states, um, and we detail this in the book, patients are told that abortion uh, has a link to breast cancer, which is absolutely not true. Um, uh, told that it will impact uh, your future fertility, uh, told that it will make you suicidal. I mean, all these things, and all these things are not true. And, you know, and I would like our audience to consider what does it mean that health professionals are essentially being ordered, you know, by their government to lie mm -hmm. to their patients and violate one of the most fundamental principles of healthcare ethics. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't lie to patients. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and abortion providers in many places are, are, are re literally forced to do so. Yeah, I think, um, and I'm trying to remember the film where I saw this specific scene, but there's a scene of, of Dr. Willie Parker um, sort of talking about the, you know, sort of going over the form, reading the, the form, and then afterwards saying, however, as a physician, I am bound by my ethics to tell you that none of this is actually true. This is all inaccurate information, but by law, I have to tell you this. And, yeah, and we have, yes, I remember that. I think it was in the film Trapped. And, yes. we, we, and we have an incident in our book uh, where a provider is telling us how she went through, you know, you you know, you may be infertile, you may get breast cancer. And the patient says, why are you telling me this? <laughs> um, Francine, I, I just, I, I'm checking the chat and I just wanted to quickly um, get one question here that someone asked, when you mention parental contact, does that mean that you are required to contact parents of minors um, regarding abortion services? Can you please elaborate? I just wanted to. Yes, Iowa does have a parental notification law. And so um, we don't need consent, but um, it's implied. Um, and so um, minors do who have scheduled for an abortion either need to notify um, one parent or a legal guardian um, within 48 hours. The clinic has to notify them of their decision to have an abortion. Um, they have the option of notifying a grandparent also, um, or they can do judicial bypass um, we're not allowed to participate in the judicial bypass, but there are a couple organizations in UAY, in United Action for Youth here in the Iowa City um, community has really taken that on and um, handles that for um, minors who need to go through the judicial bypass process. Um, mm -hmm. They can also bring a parent on the day of their appointment mm -hmm. and um, they can sign um, at that time, which isn't consent, but it's just an <laughs> authorization form. Thank you, Francine. Um, and I just, 
I, I want to ask as a, as a GWIS professor here at Iowa, um, the, the significance of sort of feminist analysis and, and feminist praxis to, to both of, of, of uh, the work that you, you both do. Um, I, I was taken so much by, by Carol, by your books and, it, and the work that you do talking, you know, the ethnographic work that you do talking to, um, to providers, um, but also, you know, sharing patient stories. Um, and, and then Francine, the fact that, that for, you know, since 1973, uh, the Emma Goldman Clinic have been providing patient-centered care. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering if both of you, um, maybe Francine, you can go first. Tell us, you know, what, what does that do? What does that tell us about the, the significance of abortion or what should it tell us about, about why we should fight for, for care? Um, um, I... This was a hard question for me um, because, I, you know, I, I really feel like it's getting harder and harder um, to provide client centered feminist abortion care when the things that have to be done as a part of the care are regulated and required by folks that aren't actually seeking or providing the care. Um, and so although we try to continue to empower women in their choices and to make them feel like they have as much control um, during their visit as possible, it's definitely getting harder and harder um, when all of those requirements come from outside of um, the clinic and, you know, outside of, um, you know, from legislatures and folks who, you know, aren't seeking abortion care. Um, yes, I, I, I can certainly uh, un understand that. And of course, there's also the economics of health care. I mean, ab abortion, I mean, the, 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 the paradox of abortion care is that it is one of the cheap, I mean, relative to other health care procedures, it's one of the most um, inappropriately priced. I mean, in, in, in 1950, excuse me, in 1973, 74, the, as I recall, the price of an abortion at a clinic um, was now, um, was, excuse me, was then about 150, maybe $200. Almost 50 years later, uh, the average cr price for a first trimester procedure is about 550, maybe $600. Uh, Bloomberg Business News, um, I mean, it's not a feminist publication, it's a business mm -hmm. publication. And they periodically do good stories, you know, on healthcare costs. And, you know, I have something hanging on my bulletin board right here that says, if abortion procedures had kept pace with inflation, a first trimester in 2020, a first trimester procedure would cost $2,200. Now, of course, abortion clinics don't charge that. They don't want to charge that. They're, as I said earlier, patients, 75 of their patients are poor and need help with the, you know, 550, 600 bucks that they charge. So it's very hard um, to sustain a feminist model that sees every, every person needing the help and getting the health care that they need uh, in reproductive health. And um, I mean, to change top, I mean, to change slightly, you know, to go back to your question, Lena, you know, what is feminist about, I think your question was what's feminist about the approach I take. Um, you know, it's, it's feminist slash humanist. In other words, my focus uh, throughout my career has been uh, perhaps because my own father was a very humanist physician. He was a cardiologist, not a OBGYN, but a, he sort of a early on alerted me to the fact that medicine is a sacred calling. You treat patients mm -hmm. with respect, irrespective of their financial reserves. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, as a sociologist of work, to me, I have always been interested in the, in the puzzle. How can people do this work for so many years with so much, for lack of a more technical term, crap that is thrown at them. Um, you know, the, the combination of the, the very serious threats to violence that many providers face, uh, their children being screamed at in school, um, people showing up at their churches and even if they don't assassinate them like um, 
like they did to Dr. Tiller, uh, you know, humil try trying to shame them in front of, you know, their fellow congregants. Um, so you, you have the, that, that on the street harassment, and then you have all the kind of regulations, you know, that Francine, you know, has been talking about. So for me, the puzzle and that after 40 odd years, I'm still puzzling out is how do people remain sustained to this work? And it's, um, it's, it's to me, frankly, not only moving and inspiring, but fa fascinating. How, how do you keep doing this? How do you sustain a feminist approach to this work? When you could be doing a lot, when you'd have much more peace and quiet if you were in any other branch of medicine. And, you know, perfect shout out to the Emma Goldman Clinic for surviving as long as they, they have. And, and as Francine said earlier, to, to Iowa City for protecting them um, and, and showing up. Um, and as somebody who just recently locate, relocated uh, to, to Iowa from California, um, it's been one of the greatest sort of um, things to be able to, to work with Francine in any way and have her talk to my students about the incredible work that's done at, at, at EGC. Um, and I, there's a lot of questions coming up in the chat here. So I wanna get to some of them. One of them is, is connected to one that I had for both of you, which is, so what do we do moving forward with uh, you know, Trump's Amy Comey Barrett nomination to the Supreme Court and then you know, the, the, the recent election um, with Joe Biden. And so we have this sort of you know, even more fragmented and fractured sort of way, way forward. Um, what are your takes on, on what we're facing um, in the next four years? Um. Well, since, I, since, since I've said so much depressing stuff, let me give a little note of hope. I mean, obviously, obviously it's a very serious situation with the Supreme Court, uh, but I actually have a, a, a reasonable amount of optimism. I hope it's reasonable about the Biden administration. Um, I mean, he may not get a Senate, the Sen he may not get a Democratic Senate and that's a bummer, but there are things that can be done uh, by executive order. Uh, the, the sexual and reproductive health community has been very active in making recommendations to the Biden team, me among them. Um, I mean, me and thousands and thousands of other people. It's not me on the phone with Joe every day. But um, so it, it, there's executive orders. There's also what's incredibly important, and this gets very wonky and perhaps boring to people, but the kind of appointments that can be made in the federal bureaucracy are, are really consequential. Uh, DASPA, deputy, not a household word, but Deputy Assist Assistant Secretary for Population Affairs. That's the person who's in charge of family planning programs, who's, who, will, who can play a pivotal part in taking away not only the global gag rule, which Biden mm -hmm. most certainly will do, but also the domestic one, the rule we have now that if you go to a federally funded family planning clinic, they're not even allowed to tell you about abortion. I mean, things like that, who's gonna be head of the FDA is absolutely crucial. Uh, a little while ago, Francine mentioned um, that her clinic is taking part in an experiment in a pilot program uh, with, with the Gynuity Organization in New York. This involves mailing, um, mailing uh, medication abortion uh, drugs to patients at their home so they don't have to come to the clinic. This, this, this pilot program started before COVID, but with COVID, it's absolutely essential. And, and one thing I wanna say about COVID is absolutely horrible that in every way that it is. I mean, I, I, I keep getting reminded of the old proverb, you know, crisis brings opportunity as well as danger. And what we've seen during COVID is a lot of ingenuity, a lot of new ways of delivering abortion care. Uh, recently, thanks to uh, a suit by the ACLU, uh, the FDA lifted a regulation that is allowing more clinics, even if they're not in Francine's program, more clinics to mail, um, to mail drugs to patients. Uh, and um, the hope is that um, 
that this will create a paper trail that even after COVID, this will be able to be done. So, so even though we face undeniably a very serious situation, the fact that Biden won is huge, huge, huge for the abortion rights movement. And Francine, just to, to sort of piggyback off of that, I did have a specific question and Carol sort of uh, discussed this um, with regards to COVID and, and online self-managed uh, medication abortion. Um, you know, they, they're asking about um, websites like Aid Access. Can you tell us more about the program that you, that um, uh, the Emma Goldman Clinic is working with? We're actually a part of an FDA approved study um, by, uh, with Genuity. Um, it's an organization out of um, New York that does research. Um, and um, it is allowing us to be able to um, see women for medication abortions um, without having them um, come to the clinic at all. Um, and then we're able to actually mail the medications out to um, those women. Um, the folks that we have seen, we've been in the study since January of 2020. Um, so even sort of pre-COVID. Um, so we've um, you know, certainly had an increase in the number of um, folks that are utilizing that method. Um, there seems to be a great deal of success with it. And the protocols are really not any different than the protocols that we use for someone who comes into the clinic. They just don't have to come into the clinic and get um, any, any of those things done. So it's a, um, a really uh, great asset and very beneficial um, in, in this time with COVID. But um, again, as Carol said, the hope is that it really is um, laying the framework that this is something that can continue um, afterwards. Absolutely. My goodness, the chat is exploding with questions. <laughs> I'm going to try to combine some of them. Um, one of the, uh, there's a couple of questions here um, that um, are interested in, in sort of one of the, the comments that, that Carol made earlier about the ethics of lying to patients. Um, and, and there's a couple here that are, are sort of um, asking whether or not, uh, to what extent doctors who don't perform abortions or larger medical organizations um, like the AMA, how they've been engaged in this. And then another one asks um, if providers have considered raising religious objections to being required by the government to lie to their patients. The Supreme Court seems very protective of people's religious rights and especially their right to be free from being required to do anything by the government that conflicts with their religions. Um, as Carol was saying, you know, earlier, people are, are getting um, more creative, right? So, you know, is this a way to, to sort of go around these? Um, these so, I capitalism? mean, so far, no. And, it, and this is state by state. This, this is not something that um, Biden or can fix um, the, I mean, uh, to the earlier question, are other medical groups trying to help abortion providers not deal with this? Not to my own knowledge. I will say again, taking a historical perspective that over the, as, as the attacks on abortion have gotten worse, we have seen other medical uh, uh, organizations, the AMA, ACOG, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, these groups have been more in solidarity. I mean, for example, they, these groups that I just mentioned joined in the suit to lift the restrictions that prevented um, the, the medication abortion drugs from being mailed. So there has been solidarity, not to my knowledge about this, but even more disappointing there was a supreme, there's been two supreme, and we talk about this in our book, there's been two re, uh, recent Supreme Court cases, one in San Francisco trying to say, don't make us lie. Um, and, and the Supreme Court said, no, you have to, uh, you know, you're in a medical facility and we can regulate you. And then when people have brought suits against the crisis, when quote, our side has brought suits against the crisis pregnancy centers, for saying all kinds of lies, the Supreme Court said, that's okay. They're not a medical organization. Uh, this is free speech. They can say whatever they want. So it's really insult to injury. Absolutely. And I think this adds to the sort of question of, um, and, and maybe for another day, but I know that there's been um, 
I think like a, a Satanist group that has called out for um, uh, bodily autonomy as, as sacred under their under their religious ideology, and so they started to do certain challenges in the courts to to abortion restrictions. I don't know if either of you have heard of the, these. Uh, what, is, what is this group called? What is this group called? The, I, and I'm trying to remember, but it, it's it's some sort. It's connected to sort of Satanism. Um, who oh, are? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah. Uh, we all, we only have four minutes left. Maybe we not. only have four minutes. Maybe not so, go down so, the path of Satanism. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do want to ask um, for and seeing some great questions that have come up in the chat about sort of local organizing um, and and the movement um, to support the Emma Goldman Clinic and and. Uh, and other um, and other providers in Iowa. What does the movement look like now? You know, it's it's hard with COVID because uh, so much of the things that folks want to do include outreach and um, being physically um, present and available to do things, and um, it's just not happening in a state where our COVID numbers are um, rapidly rising and out of control, and so. Um, you know, we're really hoping that, um, and I do believe that we're going to see a change with Biden. I don't know at what point, but that this momentum of support continues and that we're able to physically get back together and to engage those folks that really want to support us. Um, so right now, it really just involves, um, we're going to need some support, you know, after the beginning of the year when um, the new legislative session convenes because I was still read and um, we can anticipate that many things are going to come um, down the pike. Um, we'll need some support in terms of phone calls um, and letters to the editors, all those things that you don't need to be present and at the clinic or um, out at events um, to do. So hopefully we're able to maintain um, and continue the momentum that we have for folks who want to give us some support and that's an area where it can be directed at um, really pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And also don't, don't forget Carol, Carol's book. <laughs> um, and um, there is there a listserv that folks can join, um, Francine, to just keep up with news about, about the Montgomery Clinic? There is. It's on the homepage of our website, um, and um, you just have to fill out a short form. Um, it um, allows us to send you a monthly email um, alert letter, and in that alert letter, um, if there's any calls to actions or any um, highlights going on that we need some support with, they'll be included in that letter. Fantastic. And, and just one, one final question for me. There's so many more, but I, I kind of want to leave us on a, on a good, upbeat note. Um, from, from both of your work and the history in this movement, um, what, what, are, you know, what are a couple of strategies that you want to offer for us um, you know, to do work locally, but also um, nationally, um, to keep our spirits up also <laughs> about what might, what might be coming ahead? Um, but also how to continue to support the work that both of you do. Um, well, I, when you asked that question, Lena, my thoughts went to not abortion per se, but they went to the dancing in the streets that we saw this past weekend. You know, and pol p uh, political work has to be fun or else people are not going to want to do it. And what I have seen in my travels around the country, I haven't yet made it to Emma Goldman, but I will um, someday. Um, but when I've traveled around to other clinics, what I've seen is the communities that you, that the community of support that gathers around the clinic becomes a community that doesn't just do clinic work. They go bowling together, they go drinking together, they have, they have fun together. Um, and so once, I mean, COVID of course, as Francine just said, made that more, makes that a lot more complicated. Although my understanding is some clinics are bringing back their escorts you know, as long as they stay outside. Um, I mean, it was horrible at, when COVID first hit, the, the escorts were told to stay home, but the protesters, they don't practice social distancing. They, you know, they swarmed all over the clinic without the escorts to protect the patients. So uh, when going forward, uh, 
to, to quote Emma Goldman, the founder of who, the namesake of your clinic, you know, um, what's the famous saying that really she may or may not have said, <laughs> I will come to your, I won't come to your evolution unless I can dance. You know, people have to have, you know, have to find joy and, and, and fun in this work, not, not just duly, you know, doing it out of, out of guilt or whatever. Um, ab abortion, reproductive health, reproductive justice attracts very nice people. I have found that in my 40 years. So I urge all the listeners to in any way they possibly can to support Emma Goldman Clinic. Thank you, Carol. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I think I agree with everything you just said. And, um, you know, to celebrate the victories that we do have, um, we, we're going to have a victory here in a couple of years and we're going to have a huge party. The Emma Goldman Clinic will be 50 in 2023. And so, wow. um, you know, COVID be damned. We're going <laughs> to we're, we're gonna have a huge party. And, um, you know, those are the types of things and opportunities that, um, we can we can celebrate, you know, we we've, we've stuck it out. We you know, we've continued to be here and we've continued to provide services to those in need. Absolutely. And I don't think there's anything um, greater to celebrate than than control and autonomy over our bodies, which is fundamental to to a democracy. Um, and so I, I just want to thank so much Francine Thompson and Professor Carol Jaffe for taking time um, from your busy schedules to join us for this very important talk. And I think that you've given all of us um, a lot of hope and um, we continue to, go, to do the work alongside both of you. So thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you, you to our audience. Doing... Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you audience. And thank you, Lena. And thank you, Natalie, for having us. <laughs>